Hello, I'm Yari. I'm the CEO of We Think Code, based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome to Big 5D TV, a show dedicated to news and insights for the African Middle East local digital ecosystem. Our guest today is Nyari Samushonga, CEO of We Think Code, a tuition free academy in Johannesburg that trains young Africans to become full stack software developers. Nyari believes tapping into Africa's hidden coding talent is a classic win win. Smart young people from less privileged communities gain opportunities. Employers feed their hunger for tech talent. Nyari also doesn't think a prestigious education is more important than ability, training, and drive in determining success in software development. We think Code is supported by sponsors who subsidize its tuition and hire its graduates. These include BCX, Telcom, Yoko, Investec, FNB, and many others. Nyari is an accountant by training. She spent 14 years in the private sector, including 10 years at Deloitte, before joining We Think Code in 2019. Before we start the show, we'd like to thank today's sponsor, Mono Solutions. Mono's vision is to empower SMBs in the digital landscape, making it easy for them to engage with their customers online. You can visit them at monosolutions.com. We train uh, the youth of South Africa to be software developers over a period of two years. We've been around since 2016, and our core mission is to close the digital skills divide by leveraging the high youth unemployment in South Africa. So we essentially recruit youth that show an aptitude for software development, and we train them in a tuition-free program over two years to become software developers. In the four years that we've been around, we've had 800 students that have been recruited and come through our campus. So far, 220 have graduated and 98% of our graduates have ended up in full-time employment working as software developers. And that's really exciting for us because we measure success as ending up in full-time employment. So providing access in the sense that you are not economically active and now you have this opportunity to actually have this um, upwardly mobile career where you do interesting value adding work in the economy. A lot of other industries been a tough window with the economy. The industries are shrinking, the opportunities are reducing. Tech is the one place where there's more opportunity than there are people. And mm -hmm. so that kind of created this opportunity to solve problems for two categories of people. On what we call the supply side, you have a lot of smart people that are not getting opportunities. And then on the demand side, you've got a lot of um, organizations that are looking for talent. This is actually an opportunity to sustainably make an impact. Um, and then the next thing is, I think a lot of young uh, Africans, when you'll interact with them, they're aware of technology, they're aware of the evolution of technology and they consider it exciting, but they largely see themselves as consumers of the technology. And so it's almost like an education before you even start to teach the code, to let young people know that, hey, these things you're enjoying, be it um, you know, formerly in e-commerce or in gaming or you know, any number of places where technology is showing up, there's an opportunity for you to actually be participant in creating this. And I think the reality is when you look at tech, you know, when we talk about inclusion in technology, and I'm talking about inclusion very broadly, um, what you find is people make solutions to the problems that they see and they understand. So what you'll see with the economy is we create more opportunity because people start to solve the problems that are real in their world. I mean, you've right. seen that with things like M-Pesa and mobile money in East Africa. There is a proliferation of mobile in uh, South Africa and in Africa generally, but the types of mobile phones that have that broader reach are not um, the fanciest um, top of the range smartphones. Um, interesting developments of students creating ways to teach basic mathematics and literacy and reading using feature phones. Um, so 
you don't need much data, you don't need a fancy screen. And what you're able to do with that is um, learn some math problems and get access to that. And so that's one example that I've seen that I, I definitely thought, well, this is very practical and it's solved very much within the context of who would use them. Anyone between mm -hmm. the ages of 17 and 35 can apply. And uh, we've got online games. We push a lot of advertising and that on social media uh, where a lot of young people are. Um, we also get into WhatsApp groups and try to get a word of mouth effort going. Uh, we make a conscious effort to go into high schools and tell young people about We Think Code and about software in general, because I think it's more about creating a larger pool. Uh, one of the big drives that I'm super excited about right now is an initiative we've called Women Think Code, which is about increasing the representation of women in our program to 50%. And with that one, we're going to communities all over the show. So there's after school programs, um, there's um, social groups where young women are involved and we're going in there and we're now looking at sporting events and sporting social circles because what we found is with the social media we preach to the choir the people that are out there looking for an opportunity to learn about tech looking for a software development academy are the ones that click through um, but a lot of people who do have the aptitude would benefit from a tuition free program won't click because they don't resonate with it. They think it's this, you know, far out there thing and you have to be fantastic at mathematics, but it's really just about problem solving. And once people apply using um, our aptitude tests, which is some problem solving games and um, are successful getting through that, then we bring them into our campus um, to train as software developers. Is when you hear of a program and it's tuition free and it's about inclusion, it's very easy for people to stigmatize it and not respect the rigor of the screening, the rigor of the training and the quality of the graduate. The, you know, there's the one question, which is, are we competing with the traditional university? Um, are we potentially catalyzing a disruption to how a university would run specifically um, in the context of, you know, the vocation of software development? And I think, you know, I've got a, a, a two-handed answer, which you can call a cop-out. But <laughs> on the one hand, <laughs> I think we're proving that different kinds of skills require different types of training. So then the question becomes, are we flexible enough to match the solutions to the dimensions of the problem? And I think what we're finding with software development is that when you um, are in practice with software developers, a lot of people are self-taught. A lot of people started out in other careers and ended up finding their way into software development, you know, either through research in university or engineering or something like that. And so what that means is that there are a lot of people who either later in life than straight out of high school realize that they have an interest in this thing. The training mm -hmm. in a peer-to-peer -peer environment is actually very much aligned to how you would work in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. Software is very dynamic and rapidly changing, which means mm -hmm. being in a very kind of structured, slow changing syllabus environment is not necessarily ideal for um, the progression of software. And okay. so I think these are some of the things that I look at and I say, mm -hmm. for these reasons, I think, yeah, absolutely. We're also getting to a place where we see that people are different and they learn differently. <laughs> there are traditional yeah. universities. Mm -hmm. Those universities have an entrance criteria that's like, you know, in high school, you should have, you know, achieved a certain level and you should have studied certain particular subjects and that makes you eligible. Uh, here comes We Think Code. It doesn't matter what you did or didn't study. It doesn't matter what your marks were. Um, we're going to assess your proficiency as of today. And if mm -hmm. you're going to put in the work, you can become a software developer and not mm -hmm. everyone was convinced of it. But what was mm -hmm. great is there were a few key partners that joined with us right in the beginning. Um, so that's BBD, FNB, and uh, Derivco. And mm -hmm. these are actually partners that are respected within the market. And for them, their perspective was definitely, well, there's a way we've been trying to source young talent and it's not giving us the numbers and necessarily the quality we're looking for. And so yeah. that, that gave us an opportunity to try and the success gave us credentials with partners that were already well respected. And they've been great spokespeople for us since then. And now we have mm -hmm. over 40 partners in South Africa that uh, recruit from us uh, year on year. We, we have a challenge, right? Because we have an agenda that explicitly says we want to drive inclusion. So mm -hmm. we are looking explicitly for that individual who, um, without a model like we think code, would not have been able to afford or access um, this quality of training in this vocation. Mm -hmm. And 
what that means is that the reality that's coming out with this um, pandemic is the inequality situation, not just in South Africa, but all over the world, where we have a lot of young people that are very talented, that are doing well in the program, but are not set up to work remotely. They don't have the infrastructure. They're living in crowded housing. Data is expensive. Electricity mm -hmm. supply is intermittent. And so you start to see it's not as easy as saying, oh, we're locked down for three months. Coming onto campus is, is, is dangerous for everyone right now because you've got over 300 young people buzzing around and trying to work together. And this environment is not conducive for that. And so we're definitely looking at what do those alternatives mean in the short term, maybe taking on more space than we would ordinarily need so that we can social distance as the restrictions start to come down. And then longer term, starting to see what does it mean? Do we put a Raspberry Pi um, in each student's hands and find some low cost method of making the infrastructure available remotely? One of the things that I found really interesting is um, some of our students while on the lockdown have created you know, interesting web applications. There's the one I saw the other day around funerals and remotely accessing um, you know, funerals and being able to, in a time of loss, um, come mm. together and share messages of condolence and um, that sort of thing, which I thought was really interesting. It's, it's starting to see how in that moment where now I've got time on my hands and a skill available, I can start to apply myself. As companies become more virtual, essentially decoupling the physical location of our graduate from the physical location of who needs their services creates an opportunity for us to service a larger market. Where right. currently 100% of our graduates are placed in employment um, with uh, sponsors that are physically within proximity to our campuses, this is a game changer in a good way. And I think that's something you see with a lot of crisis that, um, you know, once people are forced to shift and innovate, new opportunities present themselves. And if you're sure. open to kind of step out of the, the sadness and the difficulty of it, and also see that on the other side, it's opening up, um, an, you know, a willingness to try things differently, a willingness to, to mm -hmm. you know, work in a remote way. And maybe it might mean in the beginning for our students, like I described the situation we have with the underprivileged students needing the infrastructure. Sure. Maybe we're a bridging infrastructure provider that sets it up in the first year. I think one of the things that's been interesting about this moment in time is, you know, you've seen a lot of messages of unity and we're in it together. And I think anyone who's been a change agent in any context um, can share and show scars of how the difficult thing is getting everyone on the same page. And mm -hmm. so on the average day to try and convince everybody in an organization that it's possible to work remotely um, would be hella difficult. But in a mm -hmm. situation where everybody from the most senior person to the most junior person is subject to the same restriction, or you get to sit in the center and be like, okay, you have brought the audience um, you know, to one venue and I right. can now preach a little bit to a choir as opposed right. to having to do the entire conversion of the, the mental construct. Yeah. So I think there's opportunity for us here, but definitely like everyone else worried about what this means for the economy coming out on the other side. I think, you know, when you work in a startup, uh, optimism is a, is a key, key credential. So I, I'm looking at it optimistically. I think for me, the view is continue to absorb as much information as possible and take a pragmatic stance that's like, okay, we've got to be agile in this mm -hmm. environment, in this context. Make sure that, you know, you're listening and you're trying out different things. Um, there's a community of support around it. I mean, you're seeing landlords giving um, rental reprieve. You're seeing a lot being done for everybody to kind of try and cope. My hope is that we, we stay in that element of goodwill and cut each other some slack and mm -hmm. see that um, no one's going to run away with it and be okay. Uh, we're either going to lift out of this together or crash or together. Definitely geographic expansion. Um, we're keen to have a, a Pan-African footprint. So currently mm -hmm. we're in South Africa and starting from next year, the mission is to be in a Pan-African representation. So straightening out into East and West Africa is what we're looking at doing. Um, the next area of expansion is around the offering itself. We've primarily focused on um, core software development skills. We want our alumni to come back and learn new skills. We want practicing developers to see us as a, an opportunity for them to hone their skills, learn new specializations. Mm -hmm. And back to the issue of opportunity that you were talking about is, you know, with digitization, what happens is you've got a loss of certain old and traditional jobs. 
as we think code, we've already created a model that is able to identify people with proficiency for digital participation and train them. And so we're looking at working with our partners to actually see scenarios where they would have retrenched people and assist them in reskilling them as software developers and keeping them on. So that's our view for expansion. So look forward to seeing us in other countries on the continent and look forward to us talking about um, specializations in software, um, things like cybersecurity, building you know, evolutionary architectures and microservices, and actually having a voice in more niche parts of technology as opposed to just the found foundational aspects of it. That's definitely where we see ourselves. Mm -hmm.